So, um, I think most people around the world looking at uh, this question about for better or worse with Marcos um, would say it's going to be worse. And, and look, the Filipinos have only themselves to blame. They just voted Marcos Jr. to be the president and uh, putting the family back in power, as I said, after uh, 36 years. Um, but let's just note at this point that the Italian people just gave the top vote to a fascist party and their leader is most likely to be the Prime Minister, a woman, Georgia Maloney. And we've seen similar bad outcomes in Brazil, Hungary and the USA in recent years. So what's happened in the Philippines is part of a broader dynamic. At least we can say for sure that the Philippine election on May 9 this year wasn't free and fair by international standards. Instead being a brazen festival of vote buying on a grand scale, enormous lying on social media, red tagging of the strongest opposition candidates, arrests of many opposition campaigners and the killing of some, and gross tampering with the electronic machinery on voting day as well. So uh, I don't think the Italian people have got the same excuses. So how did uh, outgoing President Rodrigo Duterte leave this country? What is his scorecard? The Duterte administration unleashed the most violent expressions of state power in the Philippines since 1946, even worse than the Marcos years, dictatorship years. Duterte not only set aside the state's legal duty to enable genuine development, peace and national self-determination, he also actively worked against this mandate. Here is the crucible of the tragic and dramatic struggle for human rights in the Philippines today. Despite claims that the Philippine economy has experienced outstanding growth of 6 to 7% during the presidencies of uh, Benigno Aquino and then Rodrigo Duterte up until the pandemic. This growth was never equitable and has often been just jobless. The huge inequalities and grinding poverty of over half the people have continued, as has the sustained large-scale export of labour because of the lack of economic and social development in the Philippines. The government's neoliberal development policies relying on privatisation and courting foreign investment have proved disastrous for most Filipinos and failed to bring equitable development. With the pandemic, real gross domestic product as the GDP fell dramatically by 9.6%. Yet, uh, rather than prioritising relief and social services, the government cut social spending, increased taxes on the poor, reduced taxes on the wealthy and increased spending on the armed forces. According to evidence uh, from uh, research foundation Ebon in the Philippines, the COVID-19 pandemic lockdowns in 2020 devastated livelihoods across the country with the poorest 70% of families losing on average tens of thousands of pesos in income. Yet the government avoided giving more than token emergency cash assistance, even as its pandemic policies cut off livelihoods uh, for daily wage earners that comprise the bulk of the country's labour force. This resulted in 15.5 million families, or some out of 25 million, um, six out of 10 Filipino families going hungry in 2020. Today, this is really last year, around uh, 18 million families, or seven out of 10, do not have any savings and are living off only their daily earnings. When they, are not, when they were not cooped up by ever-changing, confusing and inconsistent quarantine orders. The lack of fiscal stimulus to offset this lockdown-driven supply and demand shock uh, has also caused unemployment to soar. President Duterte's budget in 2021, that is his last really significant budget, increased defence spending by 14.5%, cut social welfare spending by 50%. Um, the government uh, decided to expand its debt servicing uh, by over 86%. Um, so at this rate, debt servicing equates to nearly 40% of the budget in 2021. The, the Duterte administration also brought land reform, a crucial scheme for asset redistribution, to a standstill. His administration was the poorest performer in 32 years of government agrarian reform. It inherited a, black, a backlog of over 620,000 hectares that were ready for distribution, 
and after three years it only distributed 155,000 hectares. This is less than half the rate of uh, uh, transfers that happened under Aquino's administration, the previous one. So Duterte had relied on a traditional culture of patronage to maintain his grasp on power. In this patronage culture, individuals and families don't expect the government programs to assist them. Rather, they seek help from a powerful individual, a landlord, a local politician, when a crisis comes along. In the Philippines, there's a strong movement which does assert human rights, including the right to have a non-corrupt government whose programs provide quality, basic services such as health, education, housing and welfare. However, Duterte's violent attacks on this movement, which we call his war on dissent, uh, has put this uh, positive movement on the defensive and slowed its reach into the wider society. The result of this grim record of Duterte up to the end of 2021 was 427 uh, people killed in extrajudicial killings and there were 537 people who survived <coughs> such an attempt. So we're looking at virtually a thousand people that were uh, targeted for killing. There are 19 recorded forced disappearances, there are 700 political prisoners, of whom 480 were arrested or detained during Duterte's period. So that's his scorecard. Uh, Marcos Jr., you know, you'd think would find it hard to beat. So let's look at what he's doing. His uh, nickname is Bon Bon, and I'll call him Bon Bon or Marcos Jr. Um, he claims he only wants to unite the country. He speaks quite civilly. He hardly speaks at all, in fact. It's a great contrast from the foul, misogynist and gangster talk that regularly came from Duterte, who could barely finish a sentence properly. The conservative elite are saying, what a relief. What a relief we've got this Marcos now. But the first hundred days of Marcos have passed and they already, already reveal that things will get worse, I believe. So looking at his uh, inner circle chosen to run his office, um, he, he picked on three people, a guy called Vic Rodriguez, his executive secretary, he's already been sacked, uh, Anton <coughs> the Mayor, special assistant to the president with a huge staff, and Zenaida Ampin, who heads the presidential management staff. These three came from his campaign team and from his search committee. They had no other qualifications for these jobs, save their per close personal ties to Marcos Jr. and his family, which is really in the, the norm for Manif and Young Palace, except that um, they really showed themselves up to be amateurs pretty quickly. Rodriguez, um, he had taken all the flack for Marcos Jr. during the election campaign, because Marcos wouldn't give any interviews, he wouldn't answer any questions. There was a, a lot of pressure on him on that, and this guy just uh, deflected it all. So he was rewarded with a uh, enough power that Bon Bon probably felt he could handle. Vlad de Mayo is an old friend. He was put there for Marcos's personal requirements. Anping was the campaign treasurer and a long time aide uh, on the Ra Ramal, Ramal, Ramal Des side of the family. Um, and he, they're there to make sure that presidential events and ceremonies are really what Bon Bon wants. Imelda Marcos is from the Ron Welders family, so that's that side. But on the second day of the new administration, so we're talking about July 2, the palace began leaking like a sieve. The president had decided to veto a bill creating a huge uh, construction project called the Bulacan Airport City, Special Economic Zone in Freeport. And this damaged the interests of a tycoon called Ramon Arme. So there was an immediate uh, blast back when Rodriguez copped it on uh, YouTube and TikTok and, uh, and he's gone. Um, the running joke at the time was that um, with Rodriguez, so long as you had Gcash, you, you'd get a job. So Malacan Young Palace is now teaming with new undersecretaries and assistant secretaries, lawyers, friends of the family, campaign supporters, some well healed, um, and most of them new to government. Um, but there's plenty of taxpayers' cash to pay for them. The mayhem um, was reined in by uh, an official from the Aquino period, 
a lawyer called Paquito Ochoa Jr. Ochoa Jr. So <laughs> the wash-up was that Ochoa's brother-in-law, um, Jose Acuzar, is now a cabinet secretary. Uh, so you can see that Team Marcos was really not prepared for a proper transition. It's a bunch of family mates and hangers-on. And when he took his oath on June 30, he, he hadn't even chosen a foreign secretary, a person to run the energy problems, the environment and natural resources, science and technology, among other critical appointments. Bong Bong just couldn't deal with the competing voices, people say. While Rodriguez headed the official search committee, the first lady, uh, Lisa Araneta Marcos, who's a lawyer, and she led her own search efforts with the help of at least two members of business families. And uh, the Speaker of the House, Martin Romualdez, cousin, uh, also was started interviewing people. So um, I don't think we should be looking for competence from uh, Ron Bong's team, um, but really should that be our main concern? Uh, Marcos Jr. appears to have made an early break, appeared to have made an early break with Duterte as far as the war on drugs was concerned. Um, he was in New York at the UN recently, maybe you saw him on TV. Um, he said uh, Duterte's people went too far sometimes about this. Uh, so is this, was this posturing? I, I, I think so, I uh, As far as I know, the, the directive, you know, knock, knock, talk, 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 hang, uh, it started in 2016 under Duterte is still in force. Bong Bong has made appointments to reduce the influence of Duterte all the same. Um, and the most significant one, I think, was that uh, he appointed a different uh, head of police from the one that Duterte had put in the job just before the elections. So um, the, the, the Duterte person was shunted off to a sort of sideline job in Mindanao. Uh, so uh, some people say, oh, this is good, you know, it means the drug war is over. But in fact, it's part of a bigger pattern where the Marcos side have been pushing Duterte people out, the Duterte family pushing back. So they say it's really quite messy in, in the area of police, defence, military and national security because there are a lot of different power centres and they're used to Duterte you know, really talking to them first and uh, Marcos doesn't seem to be doing that. Um, then we have to take note that Vice President Sarah Duterte uh, she asked to be the Defence Secretary, um, but Marcos just didn't agree with that and, and he got his way, of course. So there's a tension between the Marcoses uh, and Sarah Duterte and the Duterte family, I think. Um, and I could say this, that you know, Bong Bong looks really lazy, but Sarah Duterte is a really high energy person. She really did get um, the consolation prize, I think, of a very big um, discretionary budget for herself and she became the Education Secretary. That's extremely unusual in the Philippines for a Vice President to hold any such cabinet post. Also, Bong Bong became the Agriculture Secretary. That's also completely weird. Uh, but <laughs> you just expect something bad to happen. Okay. So, um, they say all of this infighting is, is particularly ugly in, in this particular transition, more so than in previous ones. And uh, it's important to note that Lisa uh, Marcos, Lisa Araneta Marcos, is, is quite a strong player in this. So when Bong Bong, bong, bong Marcos uh, named a retired University of the Philippines professor, Clarita Carlos, as the National Security Advisors, some uh, military officers said she was too close to Beijing. Um, but the president uh, has maintained her in the office so far. Um, but apparently, Carlos is having a lot of trouble getting any of her people in to staff her office. So I think you can see, you know, she'll, she probably is going to be sidelined. On the other hand, um, and this is the, the bad side, I think, uh, clearly the bad side, Bong Bong's budget increased funding to the notorious National Task Force to end local communist armed conflict, a joint military police and so-called whole of government operation which attacks unarmed civilian critics of the government's policies and programs. This task force is a red-taping machine 
organises arrests on false charges and has targeted and targets assassinations. So, as well, Vong Bong's spokesperson declined to reverse Duterte's withdrawal of the Philippines from the Rome Statute and therefore from the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. Vong Bong is really protecting Duterte, uh, Rodrigo Duterte, from the prosecution which is coming down the line in the ICC. In his State of the Nation address at the end of July, Vong Bong failed to even mention the ICC or human rights, even the words human rights, in the whole speech. Just uh, recently, on October 12 in Geneva, at the uh, UN Human Rights Council, the new Justice Secretary, Romulia, brazenly asserted that red tagging of government critics was the essence of democracy, repeating the false claim that any critic is a promoter of armed rebellion by the Communist Party of the Philippines and the New People's Army. This attitude and policy leads to extrajudicial killings by state forces. During the recent election campaign, Romulia himself red-baited uh, supporters of former Vice President Lenny Roberto, and, and she was the main presidential candidate for the opposition, so he said she was also a red. So um, that, she had held a very, very successful rally in his area in Cavite, and he's the governor of Cavite. So he came out to prove his credentials to the Marcoses like that. So um, the fact that he's the Justice Secretary should uh, send shivers down his spine, I think. So a preliminary assessment of President Ferdinand von Marcos, Marcos Jr. is that he's just a figurehead, all smoke and mirrors. Others are, are really running the show or fighting to run the show. But the show is really as deadly as it was under Duterte. In the first 100 days of Marcos Jr., 10 people were extrajudicially killed, four were abducted and are still missing, and 37 were arrested on trumped up charges. So uh, it's not in the headlines, but really the machine is, is grinding on through the people. And since then, there have been the extrajudicial killing of a journalist and the arrest uh, on fake charges of robbery and assault of a police officer. Um, they charged two very prominent trade union leaders for this. Uh, Ms. Kara Tagaola, the international officer of the KMU Labor Center, and the president of a Jeepney Drivers Union, Larry Belguent. The false charges against these two trade union leaders actually date back to a rally against the Anti-Terrorism Act in June 2020 inside the University of the Philippines Diliman campus, a place called Freedom Park. Yet the warrants on the robbery charge didn't surface until September 2022, so just a few weeks ago, and the assault charge only surfaced on the day they appeared to address this first charge uh, last week. A classic denial of their right to due process as they were never given the chance to be heard in any preliminary investigation of the complaint against them. This is the classic lawfare tactic of the National Task Force to End Communist um, Conflict. So among those targeted uh, since June 30, that is in the term of the new president, uh, Gary Campos, a Lumad school teacher arrested on July 17, Kyleen Caseo, a nine-year-old peasant girl who was shot dead on July 19 in Batangas, she was in the fields with her family doing agricultural work. And Percy Lapid is the journalist I just referred to, a broadcast journalist critical of the current administration, shot dead by a hit squad on October 3. 16 members of the Rural Missionaries of the Philippines were charged with providing funds to terrorist organizations on August 15. It's another classic red tag. So these are clergy and uh, lay people, mainly Catholics, um, who work in that countryside. So um, it's been a sustained campaign by the, uh, that National Task Force against the rural missionaries of the Philippines for several years now. Marcos, uh, his first 100 days in office have also demonstrated a, a lack of genuine solutions for the economic crisis in the country. The issues of low wages, contractualization, lack of jobs, landlessness and debt continue to plague the people and inflation has hit a four-year high in September, like it has around the world. His economic team are technocrats who will operate interest rates and government spending levers to please the markets rather than address the dire needs of the people. How does he intend to ease the burden of rising prices? 
particularly food and fuel, on the poorest of the poor. He did promise to do it in his uh, inaugural address, but he hasn't done anything. Um, what concrete plans does he have to solve the problem of mounting joblessness? Where does he stand on the question of taxing wealth itself, rather than just income and consumption? Does he have any long-term program to solve the chronic homelessness that afflicts the bottom 30% of the Filipino people? Marcos's recent visits to the US, Indonesia and Singapore in September and October are notable for their vacuous statements and little information. And in fact, one of them was just to attend the Grand Prix. That was in the second trip to Singapore. The new administration has also failed to engage in ongoing diplomatic and judicial processes which could provide a solution to the human rights crisis. These are the international labor organizations proposed high-level tripartite mission to investigate the killing of labor leaders and union members. And um, there's also the UN Human Rights Council processes, which um, you have to say Justice Secretary Ramunia was laughing at when he made his speech. There's the International Criminal Court, a real opportunity for this president to say, let's have a good look at what happened and get the facts. But that would protect his country and his presidency from the criticism which will come for sure, um, that he doesn't care about human rights. And then there's the peace talks with the National Democratic Front of the Philippines, which is still sponsored by the Royal Norwegian Government as its third party sponsor. So my organisation, the International Coalition for Human Rights in the Philippines, has called on the new administration to seek genuine solutions to the problems of the Filipino people and to address the ongoing human rights crisis through both domestic and international mechanisms. We've asked the international community to remain vigilant for the next 100 days in, onwards and to continue campaigning for an independent international investigation of the human rights situation in the Philippines and for a just and lasting peace in the country. Let me conclude on the specific Australian angle. Australia has a visiting forces agreement with the Philippines. Australia has an enhanced defence cooperation program with the Philippines. Uh, which before it even was enhanced uh, a few years ago was $42 million. Since then, in the, the budget line is, is, is deleted. We don't know the number. Um, Australia's official civilian aid to the Philippines is about $70 million a year, but it is integrated into the counterinsurgency program. In other words, Australia is deeply engaged in the human rights abuses I've been talking about and has been so for the last 40 years, whether it's Labor or Liberal. It takes a lot to turn around the Titanic, but the new, new Albanese Labor government does have an opportunity to review this situation now. For sure, the two ministers, Senator Wong and Richard Miles, cannot say that things have improved under Marcos Jr. Unless there's more community and media attention paid to our Australian role in the Philippines, the current policies will just roll on. They will roll on to an even bigger disaster for the Filipino people and the danger that Australian troops would become directly engaged in armed conflict in the Philippines, not only training, equipping and financing the Filipino security forces in their illegal repressions. That's my picture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, for setting such a challenging picture. Uh, first, let me say that I was in the EDSA revolution that removed Marcos. I will admit that, I will disclose that, and I will not disown it. I will not disown it. I was in the People Power Revolution in 1986 at the new That's correct. But I want you to imagine this scenario. Two parents separate. The disappeared parent is badmouthed by the parent that stays and raises the children. And everything that the parent accuses the absent parent of, they witness and experience the very same thing as they grew up to be adults. And put yourself in the child's shoes, whose sympathy would win the child. The present parent, from which she hears accusations, of another parent and experiences it for himself or herself. Or the absent parent. It could 
be natural for the child to say, what's my parent? What's this parent lying to me? And that pretty much is the theme of what happened after Marcus. What was Marcus accused of? Glad larceny, plunder, yeah, 30 years of Filipino generations experienced it. Human rights violations, military police atrocities, they experienced it also on bigger scales. Why? Because now it wasn't just one person, one family being accused of, of, uh, of grand larceny. It was different groups. New oligarchs, old oligarchs coming out of the world. And atrocities committed by not just the police and the military, but also by private militia, private armies of new politicians, even by an NPA Communist Party, which they cannot deny because they, until now, fight against each other for the very purges they committed against themselves, against each other. So is that such hypocrisy? It's what offends Filipino people, like myself. I am offended by that hypocrisy. Moreover, a continuation of neoliberal policies of liberalization of trade that hurts local farmers and local workers continue. Privatization continue. The attempt to recover the loot was even diluted by Deals, negotiations, which tells the Filipino people if you must steal, steal big, so you can get away with it. And you call, and people call Filipinos stupid? I think they're stupid. Whoever accuses of, of being stupid for electing markers. They do not know the entire story. And I'm here to tell you, as a Filipino, not ashamed of my own race, not ashamed of my own people but tell the history of why this has happened. And tell the whole world, maybe it's about time we stay away so we can solve our problems ourselves. That's what we want to do. Do not look, talk down on us because we suffered enough. We suffered enough to pay the debts you lent to Marcos and still squeezed it from us. And to continue following policies that were, that were detrimental to our economy, and after 30 years, the same time it took South Korea to become a war-ravaged economy, to hosting the, the International Olympics, the poverty level hardly changed. There were still 20 million people, over 20 million people, suffering below the poverty line after all those years. And before I came to Australia, I lived and worked in Davao City for 12 years. I must say, I had rather lived in Davao City than in Manila or any place in the Philippines. Because I saw the progress of Davao City at the time. It used to be a killing fields and a war zone. The death became mayor in 1987. In, and I saw it transform from what was, it was described as a war zone in killing fields too. By 1994, it started becoming, guess what? A premier tourist destination. And not only that, Davao City became the first hub of the Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippine, East ASEAN, Ruther. And what did that mean? What did that bring to the region, which Metro Manila could not do? There was peace. Why? Because the predominantly Christian Mindanao was doing business with predominantly Muslim neighbors. And so Filipino Christians began doing business also with Filipino Muslims. There was peace. The Moro National Liberation Front became irrelevant. And what happened? from 1994 to 1996, suddenly, Ramos had this bright idea, talked to the Sultan of Brunei and other 
chiefs and said, oh, I've got billions of dollars so that there will finally be peace in Mindanao. And we in Mindanao said, huh, we already have peace. We will bring billions of dollars to negotiate with the MNLF to cease hostilities. <laughs> we already have. I was already traveling to places that were once branded as critical. So what's happening here? It says, okay, we'll give it to the MNLF to appease them. Well, there is a big warning there because the MNLF was not just one monolithic group. They were the Mananaos, the Taosos, the Magindanaos. And they said, if you give it to one favored group, there will be a splinter group. And lo and behold, a splinter group did happen. The MINF spun. And to make matters worse, when, when uh, Estrada was elected, the uh, stage movie action star was elected, he declared war on the MILF. I even, narrowly, I, near, I even narrowly escaped the carpet bombing of a village by a few hours while I was in the area. Quite frightening because it looked like a ghost town at the time. And by the time I got to the city, I saw on TV that they were bombing it with mortars. So it was a big disappointment that Metro Manila, they're still Mindanao. How to run its affairs when we were doing it well ourselves. And here's the thing. Duterte was praised by every presidential candidate in 2016 for being a model mayor. That Davao, every city in the Philippines should be like Davao until he ran for president. And that's when they used all, all, the, all the flotsam and jetsam at him, which didn't stick, because Filipinos don't have that short memory. And those who did experience Davao shared the story. I was one of them. But I wasn't telling people to vote for the territory. I was just simply saying, hey, let's level the playing field with information. During the, the devastation of a typhoon, Yolanda, for instance, the national government, while the national government was making a mess of distribution, the Duterte came there as the mayor of Daba with a convoy of goods, which was not enough. But he proved himself more competent than the national government, and that's what caught the national eye. Who is this guy? This dirty, tough-talking, you know, dirty talking they're in tough talking president, I mean, uh, mayor, right? They, just, they investigated Davao. They said, hey, you're right. Davao is better than Metro Manila, better than Metro Cebu, better than any of the major metropolises of the Philippines. He got rid of organized, he got rid of drugs to the extent that, at the lower extent that no other city in the Philippines could. And so everyone said, they want to be like, Dava. You want to be like Davao City? In Davao City, even the NPA, the New People's Army, had a funeral portage and parade and uh, procession for a fallen comrade out in the open streets, which you could not do anywhere in the Philippines. He passed a law that, uh, that, that allowed that forbid, prohibited discriminations against gays against Muslims or any other religion. He had free uh, cancer treatments, free dialysis. He had a 911 that worked better than Australia. So, can you blame the Filipinos for voting someone like Rodrigo Duterte? You couldn't. You could only not vote him if all you were, were buying was Western media syndicated feeds. And did he deliver? I would say he delivered on most, on, on many, I would say, not just most, many. One was when we talk about the universal basic income, he institutionalized 
what would you would call a, ma a, a minimum guaranteed income for the poor by institutionalizing that payment for the poorest families, for the poorest five million families that did not have jobs. Not only that, he made tax reform so that I'm not, I'm a fan of, by the way, I'm a fan of tax cuts, but not from the top, but from the bottom. He increased the income tax threshold of individuals. He, he, he allowed spouses to file separate income tax returns. He raised it by a multiple of four to five times the minimum, minimum wage. Contrary to the advice of his own technocrats, most of his technocrats, saying you're courting economic disaster. And the contrary happened. From, 19, from 2016 to 2018 and 19, for the first time in my own lifetime, poverty level, property, poverty numbers fell below 20 million to 16.5 until the what they call this, the pandemic hit, and it went back to 18.5, but still below 20 million for the first time in my whole life. Uh, with regard to the human rights violations, I have, as I said, the violations continued even after Marcos, Con committed by even more people which the Commission on Human Rights chose to look only at government violations because, oh, we're only, we only take care of government, government uh, violations of human rights. No, that's not what it says in the Constitution. I, I, the Commissioner on Human Rights at, this, at that time, the late Chito Gaspon, is a good friend of mine. We, are, we have kept in touch. I even spoke at City Char, and we wanted to explore a project on economic rights. Unfortunately, he has passed away. But that, but the, where was the uproar when human rights are by, being violated between the time of the death and Marcos? Oh, there was hardly any. Probably from the left, which I don't, I, because most, it, most of the victims were from the left. Let's not be shy about it. But there were also in innocent collateral damage from indigenous peoples. And it was in Davao City where there were refuge, refugee centers for indigenous peoples displaced by mining projects from other provinces. I saw it myself. I don't know of any other city that opened refugee centers. Other refugee centers were for victims of domestic violence. He opened them, and I've seen them. They were better organized and run than anywhere in the Philippines. Rehabilitation centers for people who wanted to get away from drug abuse, from pesky pushers who still wanted to sell their merchandise to them and force them to sell it. Well, that is what people wanted, and that is what people experienced. They had a 9-11. In the Philippines, you are no, your hospitals are no longer allowed to demand deposits, cash deposits, before they can be treated for emergencies. There, has, there is a 9-11 that works. So, my disappointment personally is that uh, Duterte still allowed the worst performing countries in the pandemic to run the anti-pandemic agenda which is like asking the most, the sickest doctor in the hospital to manage the patients. And that's personally my disappointment. On the top of that, what is my position on the ICC? Well, I am kind of scandalized by the ICC because most of its funding come from billionaires, from private individuals, not from governments. Enjoying lavish lifestyles, picking up, picking only on third world dictatorships, which they accuse the Duterte of. And I know personally, I knew personally the late Jude Sabio, 
who filed the case in the ICC. And guess what? He regrets. He regretted having filed it. He told me personally that he was enticed to do it. And he told me a lot of stories that I won't disclose at this time. But I told him, for your protection, tell ev write everything down you told me into a affidavit because it may come useful to you. And that he did. And I am curious enough to say, to ask the ICC, I said, if you want to, if you want to investigate it in the Philippines, I think come as uh, any ordinary investigator or a visitor's visa. Find out for yourself. Because I'm curious as to how the ICC will classify narcos as a, an oppressed and marginalized people. How they can measure the existence of, uh, of a genocide in the light of declining murders, homicide rates, and crime rates in general. And who they will ask, how will they conduct the investigation? Because if they come in so arrogantly and are very selective as to who they will interview, then why should the Philippines join such a body that can't police its own ranks properly? So when Duterte left, he did not bother trying to amend the Constitution to extend his term. He had a 72% rating, the highest ever of any president. And would you blame him? Would you blame the Philippine people? I don't. We are not dumb. I agree that it's, it is unfair that one out of every Filipino is exported like a commodity. Now let's go to Marcos. Is it for better or for worse? After the first 100 days of Marcos, Marcos enjoys a 58% popularity rate, meaning there's a low, if any, voter regret. And it's not right that they came back in power in, 20, in 2022. Marcos, this Marcos Jr., his sister, ran for, ran for, successfully ran for positions in their home provinces. So, you're saying they went back in power, it was that early. Their own mother and the top crony of Marcos was allowed to run for president. Where is justice? Who, are the, who was the government? Who were the peoples in power fooling? So you can imagine that, and there were lots of questions in the 2016 vice presidential election which were not resolved. So a lot of sympathy swung to Marcus Jr. And as I said, can you blame the Filipino people? A hundred days is for me too early to make a judgment. I know he's made a lot of errors. I know that he's law, and this is something I would have to say, remarkable that an ex executive secretary who was close to him was sat in favor, for, in favor of a former Supreme Court justice of the death day. Who I think is better equipped because a lot of the laws require vetting and interaction. But with regard to the insurgency, I think it's about time that I'm hoping, I thought the hope, this is the opportunity to really pursue social reforms, a social reform agenda that will finally resolve the problems of land tenure, equality of rights of labor, and entitlement to their just wages. That we that the Philippine economy stop exporting its people like it were commodities and chattel and instead concentrate on churning products and good and goods that the rest of the world wants. And it is possible. Uh, and I would dare say I am on the side, not so much on Marcos, but on the Filipino people that chose this presidential candidate, that chose this president, and in the, after the first 100 days, choose to stand by him. 
I think it would be better for the world to learn to respect that and learn to understand <coughs> why that has happened. Thank you. I'd like to just um, ask a question of either uh, probably Joffrey, if it's Peter, um, I hope I can manage to uh, uh, put this into words precisely, but um, I did a thesis on the USA and Indonesia from 1945 to 65, and of course in the course of that, uh, did some study in the Philippines. And it would seem to me, just on the surface, let's say advisedly, that from the very beginning of the end of the Second World War, that was a war where could, things could have been different because the Japanese swept through the Philippines and Indonesia and elsewhere in Southeast Asia. They got rid of temporarily, momentarily got rid of the old imperial powers, including the US. MacArthur ran off to Australia. Um, that there could have been change for the difference. But in 1946, in the presidential elections, Manuel Rojas, who had collaborated with the Japanese, um, who was actually indicted as a war criminal, was actually anointed by um, MacArthur, who had returned to the Philippines, to be his preferred presidential candidate, and duly became Philippines president. And from then on, the people that he hunted down and attacked and killed were the Hukbala Hap, who were trying to introduce land reform in the Philippines. And that seems to have become the pattern and course of events with variations for decades to come. Um, you know, you, I guess you can, uh, there are definitely many variations on this, but in, in, in a number of ways, the large owners of the states, the sugar states and other other similar to in the Philippines and the vanilla business people essentially came to run the show uh, with American backing, uh, while anyone who was trying to make a progressive difference got hunted down and killed. And it, it seems to me that what we have with Maria Ressa and Duterte is simply another variation on that theme, on that course of events, that current in the river that just seems to keep going and going. Do you think that's a reasonable description of what's happened over there? Uh, thank you. I would say it's reasonable with the exception of Maria Reza. <laughs> I believe that Julian Assange served the Nobel much more, much, much more. But the problem that you correctly described goes all the way to the Filipino-Spanish revolution, right? The revolution in Spain. The uh, American invasion. Prior, yeah, even prior to the American invasion. Because the American invasion, the revolution erupted in 1896, prior to the Spanish US War. Right? And the Philippines was also attracting the eye of Dr. Sun Yat Sen. Because Sun Yat Sen was admiring the way the Filipino generals at the time were keeping the Americans at bay, winning every battle. And said, gosh, we can learn something from the Filipinos and ask how to end the dynastic rule in China. Unfortunately, and this is where Rizal, the national hero, becomes also controversial, not all educated elite wanted independence for the Philippines. Rizal himself did not say, I want the Philippines to be an independent republic, which surprises me. He wanted the Philippines to, he wanted Spain to be federal and for the Philippines to have an equal status, and Philippines have equal st status as well, as Spanish citizens and states, which is not independence. But for him, that is his idea. So he didn't even want to join the revolution and be the Philippines' first president when the revolutionaries were trying to bring him out. But the Andres Bonifacio, the organizer of the Katipunan Revolutionary Army and government, is, was uh, wanted the republic. But his leadership was something the educated local elite, most of them, could not accept. And so they really railroaded the revolution to marginalize and exclude 
uh, Bonifacio and eventually have him executed summarily along with his brother. And the elites over time collaborated with the Americans to diminish the power of the revolutionary government by betraying the very generals, assassinating them outright at times. <clears throat> and why? To preserve those, to preserve that economic hegemony of, of uh, a strong oligopoly of land ownership and business interests, which continue to today. And I believe that we, this, this historical economic movement must be confronted and reformed. And I'm hoping that this is a good time because this is where the will of the majority of the Filipinos has never been so more solid since Edson. But at the same time, more vigilant because imagine a lot the executive secretary himself was eased out because of popular pressure, because of the vigilance of people. So this may be a good time to start confronting and talking about it. Thank you. Is that enough, John? Yeah. I guess I just should add when we're talking about Australian trains, What's been happening in the Philippines in the 1950s and 60s and onwards, I, I personally feel, I'll leave that up to others to make their own judgments, but that what's going on in the Philippines uh, is something that Australia is actually part of. Uh, I think it sees people in Australia see the Philippines as somewhere remote over the horizon. <coughs> but in fact, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization was, said, was founded in Baguio in the Philippines in 1954. And during the Vietnam War, the two big bases that the Americans used were um, uh, Subic Bay, which was an ancillary base to the 7th Fleet base in Acosta. But the bombing missions, a number of the bombing missions into Vietnam were flown from Clark Airfield. So actually, and Australia, of course, was a member of CETO. Um, so in a way, we were much more <coughs> right into it than you might imagine. If I may, on a personal note, the reason why I, what, what I, I am grateful to Australia for is learning its economic history that the Philippines can learn from. The transformation of the Australian economy from the Eureka Rebellion to its Commonwealth nation was amazing. Australia had the high, and New Zealand, which pursued the same economic reforms in fact, had the highest per capita incomes at the turn of the 20th century. And Australia seems to have forgotten how it was done. And I'm, so, I'm, I'm very blessed and grateful that I am in an organization that, has, that continues to study it. And this AI am able to share it, not just in the Philippines, but more so Australia, because it breaks my heart to see an entire nation forgetting its own success formula, which is I don't want to say a policy, but really a philosophy where what is due to the individual should be rendered to the individual, what is due to society should be rendered to society, and what is due to nature should be rendered and returned to nature. I can talk more about it, but not today. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Edwin. Uh, you know me? Yes, of course. Uh, you know that uh, Rodrigo Duterte uh, was close to some uh, drug, long drug loads like Peter Lee, Peter Lee, and he released several uh, known uh, convicted drug lords from prison. I'm not sure if he. Uh, what you call this? He uh, pardoned that, and then uh, we also know that uh, many of the known uh, the known drug lords in the Philippines, like I mean, alleged known drug lords like the Parahinos, Espinosas, 
and uh, there's that mayor in uh, Batangas who was uh, killed by a sharpshooter, and some others. What do you say to the allegations that Duterte is only eliminating the uh, competition in the drug business and that uh, he himself is a drug lord? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, you want to answer that? All right. Okay. I'll, I'll That's a very, uh, I, I like that question because I can't answer it in a short sentence, but I would advise you to watch Peaky Blinders <laughs> on Netflix. Because it's, it, it sounds like a very similar plot that happened in the UK, where, organized, where the politicians had to learn how to deal with organized crime. Right? That it's not why it's, here is the problem with, say, the Colombia cartel after, after, uh, after what's the name of the Pablo Escobar, right? He chopped. Chuck Pablo Escobar set off, and what happened? Hydra, a lot of Hydra heads popped up, right? So, what would have been the, what would be a better way is to control some, let some off steam, keep them on a very long range. Because the ultimate measure of a success in an anti crime, anti crime campaign is less crime. And we have, I, I even personally say, I feel safer in the Philippines, walking the Philippine streets after the death than before the death. And that's a very personal, very personal and heartfelt opinion. Because I know at some places in, the, in Manila and the Philippines, I wouldn't dare walk at night. But after, after the death, I felt safe and walk, could walk anytime. Just like in Davao, when I was living there. Davao streets were safe to walk in the 1994, when I began working there, unlike in Manila. So that would be my, my answer. Okay. I'd just say, um, from our investigation at the uh, International Coalition for Human Rights in the Philippines, uh, it's a misnomer to refer to this operation as the war on drugs. It's a PR exercise because this this operation worked by the police going to the bar barangay captain <coughs> demanding a list of names of people who were basically, you could say, suspected as drug users or drug peddlers, but basically any troublemaker. If the barangay captain didn't give a list, and some, of course, didn't do that. They got killed. And all the people on the list got killed. That's why it's such a huge death toll. The police admit to 6,000 in the six years, but the uh, deaths under investigation category is, is over 30,000. So I don't accept what uh, was said by Joffrey that the, the crime is down or even that the drug business is down. In, in uh, the Philippines, according to the regional research of the UN, um, so Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, the price of uh, methamphetamine is now like one third of what it was before the war on drugs started. So the Philippines is a wash with drugs. They're cheaper than ever. And uh, that this uh, whole thing has been a terror, a war of terror, on really quite poor communities. And why does somebody go to the International Criminal Court? Because the very first moment, they, the very first step to make a complaint in the Philippines, they're rebuffed. The first time they go to the Ombudsman's office to say, the police killed my relative, the Ombudsman has dismissed the case as that the police were just carrying out normal operations. So that's why people are at the International Criminal Court. And of course, I think we should criticise the International Criminal Court for its uh, obvious uh, profiling or focusing on uh, people like the President of Sudan or from uh, Sierra Leone or Ivory Coast. Uh, and you could extend that to the Philippines, but the, the thing is, we have got uh, investigation, we have got facts, and some judicial authority should 
be able to rule on them because the judiciary in the Philippines has completely failed to rule on them. So that's that's uh, our finding. Sure. Yeah. There's one. Okay. If there were, if we were to accept the count of uh, Peter of thirty thousand, put that still over historical context and include it in the number of murders, homicides. There was still a decline in the murder and homicide rate over time. And there is still a general decline in crime because I'm not the only one who says I feel safer in the streets. I remember whenever I come, go to the Philippines, even at the airport, I beg my relatives and friends to pick me up because I don't want to be subjected to the vultures. Now I can take a cab and pay the proper fare based on the meter. Something that you could that would only happen in Davao before the the the, the game pressure. So there you go. It's uh, statistics, and I'm terrible. I'm very very interested in finding out exactly how the ICC will conduct in its investigation. Also, uh, by all means, ICC, not yourself. So Yes, uh, earlier you praised the third year for uh, eliminating uh, crime and uh, disturbances in Davao City. And uh, we all know the problems in the early 90s in Davao City was caused by uh, vigilante groups, the Al Samasa and others. And we also know that the National Endowment for Democracy funded these uh, groups. Uh, one of them was uh, Jun Pala, the head of the Almas, Al Samasa. But then, after a few years, it disappeared. Uh, I won't credit that to the third because. Uh, it wasn't him. Hmm? I agree, it wasn't him. Yeah, it wasn't him, but uh, the, uh, this uh, vigilante group simply ran out of funding. That's why they stopped. And uh, many of the. Uh, leftist and uh, CPP and PA groups left the city. That was before Duterte. And uh, that's why Duterte was able to uh, minimize uh, crimes and uh, uh, law and order uh, problems. Uh, so say, to, tell, to say that uh, Duterte got rid of all these uh, problems, I wouldn't credit all to him. It was uh, mainly uh, economics. economics and uh, the U.S. Uh, intervention in Davao that uh, forced it. And then probably the NED ran out of money. And uh, that's why uh, peace ranked again. But I wouldn't credit it to the target. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question. It's a good question. I agree it's a good question. It's a good question. Good, it's a yeah, and the, question, the answer is this. If, they, if, if and this happened in, among the corrupt in the police in the later part of Corey's administration, when they ran out of money, they engaged in crime. When people used, who are used to applying violence on a populace runs out of funding from the external sources, they stay, they don't leave, they stay and look for other means of making up for the lost revenue. Why did they do that in Davao? My answer is, they didn't dare. Why? It's not only the Delta that they'd be afraid of. They'd be afraid of Davaoanians like myself. We won't let it happen. We don't let it happen. Okay. Might the last one. Well, thank you very much for those you know, enlightening discussions. Right? But um, I will share you what I experienced because I went to the Philippines during the election. No, no, or last? Just this, this rest one. Okay. Um, our house which is quite near before the mga police because we are near 
in the municipal hall. Oh, the procedure, the that's right, in Campus Tarlac. Ooh, okay. So more or less, you have to say that we will be safe, right? Mm -hmm. And I was told by a lot of people in there that the first thing that they do during that, like, you know, the drugs is to get all the people who are supposed to be drug addicts and they bring them all in the municipal hall, go around the town to present them that these are the people. The thing is, did it stop? It did not. It's because it's showing that these are the small, these are the small people that you take. You don't take the big people. And that's why I always ask me asking, so how about those extra judicial killings? Because we went, I went to the, um, what do you call this one? These are the ethnic groups in our town. They call them the Aitas. What problem? Uh, Tarlac. So these are the Aitas people. And then I've asked them about it, you know? Because it's very, uh, what do you call this one? It's being promoted. It's being promoted in our small little town. Because now our town is no longer considered a small town. It's like a small little city. Mm. We have, you know, we have small little, uh, Progress came to Kapan. That is right. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's very, you know, when I go there, I grew up with surrounded by rice field. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no more rice field. Mm -hmm. It's all full of houses. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm lucky, you know, my, my parents were really, uh, what they call them, landlords. But it's not that, uh, it's not the solution for it. And so a lot of, a lot of houses were all made of, um, they're not concrete. And so I asked my, my sisters, She's been living there for such a long, long time. And I said, so what been happening was there less drugs in the, you know, in our, um, in our town. She was saying, you don't see them, but they are there. And you can be saying that there's less, um, what do you call this one? Less crimes, but it's not. Probably you might be lucky in the bar that you can be walking around. In our place, you can't be doing that. Uh, can you ask who, are the, who the dominant families are in Tarla? The dominant family? Well, the one near Tarla will be the Aquinos. Okay, thank you. And who's and the others? Uh, the Shandalusi. The Kowanko, yes. Okay. Thank That's you. right. I yes. think the people should know that. It's not the Duterte, it's not. No, 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 no. no. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that that is a different. It's supposed to be during, supposed to be the Aquino time, because this is one mm -hmm. we've yes. always been seeing, well, isn't it? During the Marcus okay. time, the one that benefits are the one within your provinces, right? But then again, we were supposed to be benefiting mm -hmm. in, you know, during the Aquino time. But it did not happen. Mm -hmm. Is it because um, the, the people who are in power, we don't really know, right? But yes, in our, the one during the election, the one who were empowered was a new, was a new uh, people. Mm. So what I'm trying to say is that probably in different places in the country, probably experiencing different situation and different benefits, you know, the pros and the cons. But I think overall, when I even talked to some of my you know, friends in, in, in Mindanao, they were saying, as what you were saying, they feel like it's much, much better. But then it's a question is, where are you getting your news? Are you getting it from the right source? Or where are you getting it from? Because in the Philippines, even the people in our, you know, mga, what call it, call them kasambahay. These are the people who help my sisters. You know, their means of uh, news mm -hmm. is Facebook. That's all it is. You only have to pay 10 pesos. Which is how much is that in in, in Australian one? Three cents. Three cents for three days. How oh, very empowering! You can see that. That is right. But then again, what do you get in Facebook? And the thing is, to you know, one example, one example which is so uh, funny. Um, the one in our Kasambay was saying, "Tita," because she, they know I'm from Sydney. Wow, the Sydney people are really congratulating. Uh, Duterte and Marcus, because you know the so Sydney Opera House. It was there, right? But it was not even during the uh, the vivid. It was not even there. But because that is their means of news, 
they thought what it is. The same with, yeah. you know, Queen Elizabeth congratulating, yeah. you know. And the, and the very same news media was using that is right. that, right? But this, that's what I was saying is that some places might be receiving the real news or not, mm -hmm. but if you are just like Fox News, if you're just listening to the same news again and again and again, you thought that was the real thing. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, it's just it's quite yeah. long. I was just trying to, you know. No, I, I, I agree. That's why uh, uh, vigilance isn't a one-time deal. The very same media available to your enemies is also available to you. You've just got to learn to mind and investigate yourself. Uh, a comment also on why drug drug prices are falling. It's a bit of economics. It's not because necessarily because supply goes up, but demand has certainly gone down. I've spoken to a lot of former addicts and said, I'm glad I got I kicked out that habit. And I'm glad that the the drug dealers aren't in the neighborhood anymore. Because now I can finally do my living as a cab driver, as an Uber driver, or as a vendor. So that would explain also why prices of drugs fall. Thank you. Okay, we're going to finish there. We've gone a bit over the time. So please, uh, you can thank Joffrey and thank me. Thank you.